Hey everybody, welcome back to Woodworking Wisdom. My name's Colin Way, and today is the second part of our Nutcracker build. So you know what the, the form is. If you saw yesterday or part one, if you're not watching this live, this is the kitty that we're going to make, or a slightly smaller version, so a more a more mantelpiece friendly. These big guys and the bigger ones are for um, putting next to the fireplace, really, so it's standing on the floor. But the ones that we're making, the little 300 mil or the 12-inch versions, um, okay, are that sort of big, and they're great for the mantelpiece. If you remember yesterday, we were speaking a little bit about the folklore around these and that they're good luck charms. And in this sort of size, they're a great gift. These are a little bit more to construct, um, but when you do the smaller ones, you can you can do a few more of those um, and they're a little bit easier to build, easier to find the timber. You don't have to laminate timber up together, all those sorts of things. So let's just take this bruiser away. I'll put him to one side at the moment. Now, remember yesterday we were talking about um, well, most of what we done, in fact, all of what we done yesterday was the turning. So we're going to still do a little bit of turning today, but we want to look at uh, embellishments as well. We've had a few questions overnight. Um, a couple of questions are where can I get the, the plans? So if you remember yesterday, we were speaking about line drawings. So line drawings to actually build your own nutcracker. So um, there we are. Now, these are available. They're in the links below the video. So have a look there and you'll get the line drawings. Gives you a few ideas in face decoration, but also, and most importantly, the dimensions that we've got for this size of nutcracker, the, the mantelpiece nutcracker um and also when we say nutcracker i'm gonna use the term um loosely um in, in as the the um years have gone on the nutcracker part of the the figure has disappeared um you can still put the mechanism in and we'll look at that in a second i've got some props here to show you what i'm talking about there but what we're looking at today is we're building um a nutcracker without the nutcracker part so ben we got ben on the cameras everybody ben's asking the questions don't forget to use the chat facility he'll um here ask the questions but look we've not got the nutcracker section in the back this is purely just a decoration the same as the bigger guy he doesn't have um the mechanism in either um if you wanted to put the mechanism in um we're going to look at how we can create that so it's basically creating the slot so um, certainly if you're a beginner turner if you're not um, uh, if you haven't been turning for a long time i would say this next stage is definitely i would avoid it and you only really need to do it if you're desperate to get that nutcracker mechanism in okay we, we like i say we'll look at it later on let's get the basics done first though okay so that's our size that's a nice easy bit of turning everything we've done so far um, and if we get our figure out if you remember we turned the base yesterday we turned the legs now since yesterday i've drilled the bottom of those feet out so the legs can slot into it and i just used like i said it's a 15 mil drill bit um drilled out on the pillar drill and then the legs can go flat onto it but it leaves the the front of the foot which is quite a nice um, little section don't forget the legs we had drilled already both sides so we've got those dowel points so I'm just going to put a couple dowels in there just to so we can move on. We also turned the body yesterday, if you remember. Let me just give those a tap down. Now, the body has several um, parts to be drilled. So I have the body over here, and this is going to be a lovely transition into um, looking at slotting the body. So that was from yesterday. That's our finished bit from yesterday. Our turned body is in the cradle. And again, remember what we were talking about in part one. It's about making the cradle. If I want to create the slot, which is a fairly big slot, traditionally they would have been carved out. They would have been a hammer and a mallet and, and a saw, and they would have cut out that way. You can still do that, no problem. If you're only making one, probably advise that. Bandsaw is quite a good thing if you can set yourself up with a, a V-block to cut them. I've tended to route all of mine out, so using a, a router. So with that's the shape we have to create. To do that, you need to hold your turn body firm. So look, this is what I've made here. It's just a little cradle um, and with the irrelevant slots where we need the slots. And then if I move over, probably direct me a little bit here, Ben. I'm not quite sure where I'm going to go with this. Um, let me get all the other bits out the way. So this is my router box. Let me 
Let me move. There we are. That's the router box. It's a fairly simple construction. The, the, the complicated bit really is the inside. But let me just show you the outside first. So a little block of wood on the bottom. That, mean, wait, that means I can put it on my router bed, on my lathe bed, sorry, in the slot between the bed. Um, so it's nice and firm. And then a couple of clamps either side just to lock it down firmly. Okay. But then let me again go to that camera, Ben. If I hold it there a second. So what I've got is a parallel couple of um, bits of timber in there. So when I want to route out the top slot, I can put that in my cradle and then into the box, put the top of the, the router box on. And then I use a router with a, a template guide that follows this slot that I've cut out already. And that puts me the right size slot up through the middle, which is about 25 millimeters. Um, and then do that, turn it round. This is another slot. This is going to take, take it lengthways. But this one's slightly tapered. It's on an angle. And again, you push that down and you route your, you route your slot in. And so you'll have a slot top and bottom. And it comes out looking something like that. Okay. So you can judge. I don't know whether you can make out. There's a very fine taper um in that slot there it's just to help the mechanism move when you get the mechanism or make the mechanism this is the shape i roughly cut out okay that i'll slot in there and then just use a pencil once you've got the rough shape use a pencil then just describe around your your shape you can be very intricate and cut directly around what you've got okay or you can just describe a straight line down through doesn't really matter most important bit though is here you have to scribe that to the body shape okay so just with a pencil then you can take that away and then you're ready to sand that to shape so give you a nice mechanism again we've already got the hole here okay so what i would do once i've drilled this and this hole is a through hole it comes right the way through both sides once you've got the mechanism inserted you drill all the way through to your other hole um, and then you've got your position for your pin to go through and it's up to you you can use a bit of dowel or you can get yourself a bit of silver steel and use your silver steel and pop that through okay and that will keep everything in place and create your mechanism okay like i said if you're going to actually use these for cracking nuts then you really need to produce something a little bit stronger than a regular piece of wood. Regular piece of wood will always have weak spots in. And the grain in this piece is running down here. Okay, so your weak spot, your join is going to be right there. The nut will be cracked here, so that will always be weak. So if you're going to do one of these to use, I would add a bit of silver steel in there, drill out and epoxy that in so it's really firm, or use a piece of plywood or something like that to, to give you a little bit more strength. OK, but that is but that's that's assuming you want to make one with a mechanism. We're not going to bother. OK, we're going to make it nice and easy. Let me just get this out. We'll get rid of our router box. I don't have downloadable plans for this. I did have a look last night. I've done some line drawings, but they are just by hand line drawings. I have nothing uploaded at the moment. So we're going to get that one out of our way. There we are. We just take out our body. Before I do that, though, sorry, Ben, I'm messing you around here. Can we go back to number three a minute? Before I take it out, this is not just a little router cradle. This is also my drill guide. So it's got my arm holes in there. It's got the two head holes. Now, these head holes would be to join the head on to the body if I was putting a slot in. If you're not putting a slot in, a single hole in the center of the body is absolutely fine. That's all you need. However, in the bottom, as we discussed yesterday, um, or in part one, we've got two holes for the legs to join. They have to be a specific size. Those holes match up with the template we were looking at yesterday as well. But two templates, one says bottom, one says top. So the bottom is the bottom of the body. The top is the top of the body. And so those holes match up. Now, if you remember those holes we drilled in the base, so they have to be absolutely parallel with the body holes as well. Yes, Ben. First question. Hello, everyone. Um, so first question from Fuller here. Um, he's asking, well, he said it looks like a very deep slot. Um, considering the added thickness of the box lid, would you ever use an extension collet to extend the depth of cut? No, no. But what I do have instead um, is your is worktop um, cutters. 
So these are the longest cutters that I can use. So they are half inch because of the depth that we're going to. Um, and by the way, the, the lid of that router box is only thin material. Um, it's only nine mil. And this is a bit of shower, shower wall. So it's a high density um, fiber board. Um, and it also has an incredibly slippery surface. So brilliant for doing this sort of thing. It will kill um, blades, so uh, bandsaw blades and things like that. You'll see the blade sparking as it goes through that. And same with saw, uh, circular saw blades, so do be careful. But it's nice and thin, as thin as I can get it and as strong as I can get it. Um, and then on a half-inch shank, um, a long kitchen fitter's bit, okay? Um, you're, unlike cutting... Um, uh, kitchen worktop these will last a long time doing this job okay so i've got two of those they're, they're they they look battered but i do sharpen them regularly with a diamond file um to keep them going but you need something of that length to get down that deep obviously yes ben and um, i just wanted to show uh, well the, the pictures come in from from martin and he's made a three foot um nutcracker it looks really cool <laughs> yeah, i can't show done. you on the screen here but um it's really nice. Well, we can get that on the on the website. That we'll certainly let, get everybody to see it there. There we are. So I've drilled this out. What I'm going to do is there's a little bit of burring um, here. So I'm just going to sand that off. And we can start adding this to our build. Now, we haven't got into the embellishment bit yet. But below the video, you'll see loads of links for the parts that we're using, for the plans, but also to another website. We mentioned it yesterday. It's Emma Cook's website, Tiny Turner. She has um, loads and loads of um, bits that will enhance these in her shop. And the most important bit is the fur for the hair. Um, you never know. She's got lots of projects there as well. So you might want to have a look at doing some of the projects. But for this bit, what I bought um, from Emma were the fur sections. And they're a convenient size for what we're doing here. Two inch by 150. Sorry, two inch by six inch, I think. Um, and that wraps perfectly around the size of head that we're making at the moment. So let me, a little bit of trimming, of course, but that wraps around perfectly. It's still going to give you your, your amount of face to, to draw the eyes and, and everything in there. Okay, so you can get those in that sort of size. Okay, if you want to make a bigger one, just talk to Emma. I'm sure she'll be able to, to help you out with bigger bits of, of that material. But have a look on our website. The link is below, like I said. And when we get to that later, when we get to the embellishment later, we we will talk about all the other all the other bits and bobs that I've got in there. But uh, well worth a look. So Tiny Turner website. Follow the link. Wait until we finished here, of course. Um, but follow the link and have a look. Right then, let's carry on with the build. So we've got uh, base, feet, legs body line it up give it a tap i mean for me nutcrackers pretty much iconic christmas decoration um we do have a lot at home if i'm honest not just mine i do collect them but look we're ready now to create the next section so we've got arms head hat to create so not it's not they're not that difficult let's start with the arms we are going to do two i'm going to get everything done for you i'm going to speed up i felt it was a little bit sluggish late yesterday so we're going to speed up a little bit more today skew chisel is a good good wakening um we'll speed up if i put the right centers on we need ring centers and i found my ring centers for the day so let's have a look so ring center both sides so that'll be a friction ring center in the headstock and in the tail stock we use our regular live ring center two bits of lime i've already centered them up so we've got uh, a nice nice center location i'm going to go nice and quick around about two three two thousand three hundred two thousand five hundred revs um and we use our german style skew and before I do that, we're going to answer another question. Yes, Ben. So Granda P would like to know, um, he had some fallen pine in his garden. Um, how long to dry the logs before turning, please? Oh, well, so the best thing you can do, if you're going to 
convert from uh, fallen trees is you need to split them back first, even rough turn them. Um, pine, I wouldn't, uh, in terms of bowls and things like that, yeah, you can you can practice on it. And certainly, I would certainly um, uh, put it into billets for, for squares. So for doing things like this, um, for two by twos, three by threes, that sort of stuff, lamp bases, those sorts of things, not going to act particularly well. And don't forget, now a lot there's a lot of um, uh, myth about uh, uh, wood prep from a tree. Your bowl blanks do not come from slicing a tree across it. They come from the side of the tree. So you're converting timber. You almost want to pretend you're planking, and then your timber comes from that. Okay, so yeah, in terms of drying time, if you cut it now, it's probably the right time because we're going into winter in the UK um, and it's not going to be subjected to all that heat from direct sunlight, all those sorts of things. So get it into as small a size as it can that you want to use, rough turn where possible um, and store somewhere out of direct sunlight, but with a bit of ventilation so it doesn't go moldy. All right. Yes, Ben. So there's a thanks here from the tiny turner. She's um she's tuned in today. Oh hi Em. <laughs> and then um there is a question here from Fuller. Is there a way to link the arms to the to the cracking movements when you open the mouth, the arms move with it? Yeah, it's a, a tricky one really, because if you think about the force that's involved and the link that you'll have from the arm to that movement, you know, it's a relatively small connection. Um in, in this style anyway. Um I have to research that. I don't know. I haven't seen that in any um, uh, any designs uh, either here or in Germany, actually. But it's worth a research just to see. Um, there's all sorts of, of, of mechanism designs out there, some using just the head, um, some using a back crank uh, as well. So, yeah, it's worth having a look. All right, let's rough this down. Two, just over two, 2,000 revs, two, three, two, five should be enough. I remember the push pull cut with the skew chisel. So back and forward, using the ring centers. If, for instance, you're you are a bit nervous about the skew and you do get a catch, the thing is with a ring center, that happens. So you you dip you dip your tip in the timber and everything stops bar the center itself. So they're great centers for learning to use the skew chisel and controlling your pressure. There we are, so we're down to round. So we'll create the shapes now. So the hands for our nutcracker, imagine a little Lego figure. The style of a little Lego man, the sort of hand he's gonna have. So you're gonna have a, a fairly tight curve at the top and then a, a slightly longer one down toward the front of the fingers. And then we're going to do a cuff, just the tiniest little V cut, and then the lapel or pad, and then we'll take a little bit of that forearm away, now that I've already said I'm going to speed up a little bit during this demonstration, you don't have to, you don't need to go fast, just re relax, enjoy what you're doing. There we are. Now we're just going to clean up a little bit of the top of the shoulder. Then you would sand that down to your finish. So 150, 240, 400 should be enough. And then we'll swap him out. We'll do the next one. And then we're just going to, I, want, I almost said process. I didn't mean process. Um, we're going to just tidy that up. I'm not doing any sanding, remember. But you really need to get these nice and fine. There we are. Now, you can use dividers if you want to to get your measurements just so. I'm going to guess this. Just pop a little pencil mark in. We're getting near enough. Yes, Ben? Um, so it's a question from Mark, which I missed before. Um, are the holes for the arms offset? And if so, by how much? Yes, Mark, they used to be, but I never do it anymore. Um, it would just added a complication. Um, you don't need to have them dead central to the body um, and you'll be absolutely fine. The mechanism works in the same way. 
And Nigel would like to know, um, has your YouTube channel gone live? YouTube channel's gone live. Um, just search my name. The first um, video we've got up there is fruit making. So it's uh, one of my most popular um, face to face demonstrations. And that was edited by uh, Finn. Everybody knows Finn if they've been watching any of these early streams of Woodworking Wisdom. Finley, my son. Um, but yeah, it's all on fruit making. Just search my name and you should find it. There we are, just that arm again. We're just taking out some of that some of that material in the center. Using the heel to creep up to the detail. After Christmas, when we get into the new year, we're going to go back to basics. I want to do some uh, more spindle work. I want to practice this skew with you. And we're going to look at how we use skews, spindle gouges, parting tools. We're going to go back to turning a bowl for the first time. All of that sort of stuff. I want to really go back to to where we start because sometimes i think you know we're doing all these projects but it's quite good to actually concentrate on a little bit of technique every now and again um and also ben and i have uh, a nice project to to start our year next year as well we're gonna one of your suggestions actually it was the um, basket weave effect so i'm gonna do some turning ben's then gonna do some pography and decorate those so that's that's a, a something that we're really looking forward to. Um, I'm putting the sanding disc on next. So you've all seen me use the sanding disc. We spoke about it in part one in yesterday's. But this is quite important to this project. We're going to shape the hand now. Not forgetting that I've just turned the lathe off at 2,500 revs. So lay speed to zero before turning the lathe on. Turn the lathe up, and now we're going to add our dust extractor, of course. There we are. So, two things here. First of all, I want to clean off the, the um, bits of debris that we've got here, and then I want to shape the hand. So let's do that nice and gently. We're going to go to a, a slightly finer abrasive in a minute. You're going to take your time, obviously. So now we shape the hand, turn that down a little bit, save myself from the dust. So there we are. There's our our Lego hand. All right. So we've still got this waste here. So we're going to just shape that. There we are. So we're down to almost the right, the right place. What I need to do now is just add a slightly finer abrasive on that one, just to clean that up nicely. So we're going to turn off the big disc, and we'll go to our little rotary sander head. This has got a two uh, four hundred it actually in this one let's clean everything up you can you work your way down through if you want to you can start at a 320 or or even a 240 and work your way down through but take off all the the sanding marks that's what we're trying to do with this just clean everything up ready for painting any bird over edges you can get rid of those don't forget you're taking your time you're not rushing like i'm doing Right, there we are. 
we also spoke yesterday about how we drill these and everything that I do when I'm constructing these is in a pillar drill. We don't, I'm not, I don't have the pillar drill next to me. So we are going to cheat a little bit. I certainly don't advise this, but I'm just doing this so I can get this finished for you guys. Drilling freehand. Dr drilling freehand is, is, is a dangerous thing to do. Um, I'm keeping my fingers well out of the way by using a V-block. Don't try and do this without a V-block. Um, but I really strongly advise you use a pillar drill to keep you safe and to just stop you from going through the, the project, you know. Yes, Ben. Um, Hodgepodge would like to know, if you were to, if you're planning to do a cracker holding drumsticks, would you just turn the round bead for the hand and then drill a hole for the drum drumstick? Let me just see if I can grab this one. Conveniently take his arm off for you. Um, so, yeah, this in this case, this is exactly what we've done. Look, Hunter Bosch, it's literally a hole in one end. You can drill the hole at an angle if you want to, but that's literally stuck in. Either that or um, use magnets. Now, in two weeks' time, we're going to look at German smokers again, and I seem to have been demonstrating German smokers to every club I've been to and, and live streams, IRDs, those sorts of things, um, since September. Um, but the German smokers will have tools, or weaponry, and they'll be um, held to their hands with little little tiny magnets, rare earth magnets. So that's another option. You can then move things around. The only thing I would say, and certainly on Nutcracker, is they're big enough to be able to drill holes in the in the hands, like like you're saying, um, and it means that they won't get lost when they're packed away for you know for this for, for after the this the season is gone. Right. So I'm just going to drill this. Not my chosen way of drilling, but keeping my hands well out the way. And the other reason, of course, that I want to use a pillar drill is because it's upright. It keeps everything accurate for me, where, um, unfortunately, my body's got far too many moving parts on it and uh, can never drill very accurately. And I also don't have a built-in depth stop. That's always a concern when you're doing things like this, where your pillar drills will. So, again, just a little bit of burr. Um Lip and spur on everything that we're using here. Don't be tempted to use a, a twist drill. Twist drills will just skid everywhere. Um, they won't produce a very good hole at all. So let's quickly keep using that word quickly, um, only because I know we have an hour to do this. So let's um, just off camera putting some little dowels in, ready to take the arms. So we're going we're gonna to have this guard standing to attention oh no. drilled a little bit too deep in that one <laughs> two seconds i'm off camera i've gone and drilled too deep in the body so i've lost my dowel just take that one out and start again there that's better so look there we are he's standing to attention at the moment sorry ben standing to attention he's a bit headless um at the moment so we need to sort a head out for him or if you remember on this one, though, what we've done, okay, is a centre hole. These two holes would be there if we use if we're creating that nutcracker mechanism. But as we're not, a centre hole is absolutely fine. So to connect up with that, our piece of timber has a hole on both sides. Okay, so I've already pre-drilled that, and you know what we're going to use for that one. So it's single pointed centres. And in this case, they're going to be a light pull drive and just a regular 90 degree, sorry, 60 degree tailstock center. Light pull drive is this one. So it's this little step drive. It's designed specifically for driving things that have holes pre-drilled in them. Um, you don't have to use a light pull drive. Of course, you could use a single-pointed friction drive of any kind. But um, that's my favoured one there. And then in the hole at both, both ends, we're now just going to turn to a cylinder. Make sure nothing's touching. Lay speed to zero. Turn the lathe on. I'm going to go straight to a roughing gouge in this case.
Just every time that happens, we just need to add a little bit more friction and eventually you'll get there. There, so we're down to around. So let's think about shaping now. So I'm going to go with my spindle gouge and oh, I'm just going to adjust the torus a second. Now the top of the head doesn't matter really in terms of the size you're making. Okay, the top of the head is going to be buried underneath this peak here. But the top, the bottom of the head, that's important. That has to join up um, in its diameter to the top of the body. Okay, that's really quite important. We don't want any big um, change in dimensions. So we're going to test that. So this is going to be the bottom, fairly tentatively to start with. The top, like we said, can be much smaller. Let's just take them off and have a look. Now, the head is one of those pieces that doesn't get painted by anything, apart from a little bit of red blush for its cheeks. Okay, so we need to make sure when you sand this that you sand it well, you don't have any scratches. But I'm just checking the join. We've got quite a lot to take away at the moment. Okay, there's a bit of a uh, an overlap. If I can tip them up that way, you can see the overlap at the moment. So I reckon there's a good couple of mil to take off of that one yet. So let's turn them around. Being a right-hander, a bit easier. Now we've got the top done. There we are, double check. Oh, still, you know, still a bit more, to be honest. That's going to be ample. Now, I'm going to give this one a little bit of a sand. We haven't done anything yet, but I think it's quite important on this. So lay to be down a, a wee bit. You don't want to sand too fast, otherwise you'll get dust all over the place, even with an extractor. And I want most of the, well, I want all that dust to go down the extractor, really. So use your timbers wisely. We want a nice, a nice grain on this this face area. There we are. And try and avoid timbers that have got too much grain in them, too many burrs and things like that. This one's nice and plain. I would say majority of it, majority of it is going to be covered up by the hair, but it's just that front face that front uh, part of the face which is going to be exposed so i would use the plainest area for that for that part all right everything else gets covered up here but we're getting there let's put another piece onto our figure so we can go nice big dowel on that one there we are next bit of dowel ready to take the peak for the hat so we're going to go with a nice conventional um sort of there we are nice conventional hat so we do the same thing we've got on this guy here this nice tall tall hat two parts to that we'll start off with the main hat shape because we've got centers on it already so i've got a single point in center um, to go into this hole and we need a drive center on this bit so what we'll do is we'll go single pointed on the tail stock but we'll put a little Let's go with a little pro drive in the head. All right, so we all know what the pro drives are. They're a little sprung center look. Okay.
Okay, let's get that going. So lay speed is zero, turn the lathe on. Bottom of the hat here, remember? That's the hole. What I don't want to do is go too small with this hat. So this section here, this is going to join to the top of the head. I don't actually want this to be smaller than the head itself because it, it just looks a bit weird if you've got a, a hat that's smaller than the head. How's it, how's it actually fitting on the head? So you want to keep that a little bit bigger. Um, however, it has to be smaller than the material that you use for the peak. This is going to be my material for the peak. As long as it's smaller in, in um, width and it is, then we're good to go on that, you see. So let's just clean that up. I want to make sure the bottom is nice and, and clean. I'm just going to go with my, let's go through the bowl gouge, actually, um, just to clean that little area up. There we are. So nice, nice and clean there. I'll go with the skew chisel now just to tidy up that area. Now, the minute you remove the waste here, this will stop. So don't let that make you jump. The beauty of the Pro Drive is it's on a spring. So it pushes the piece toward the tail stock when that happens, ready for you then just to re tighten from the tail stock and all's well. Now we're using a large center that's going in fairly deep so i want to make sure that i re remove enough waste that will take those marks away and again we're going to sound the top of this but now's the time to start thinking about sanding that up um and maybe a bit of sealer now for anything black on these figures i tend to use ebonizing lacquer because it's got a really nice luster about it. i use the chestnut ebonizing lacquer um it goes on almost one coat. Um, it'll dry relatively quickly, you know, as long as it's not too cold, too damp. It's usually about 20 minutes to half an hour. Um, so you're pretty much ready to go quite quickly. That's if you're putting opaque colors on. Just very briefly, Ben, I'll be right with you. If you are putting opaque colors on, like this one here, so that you can't see through to the grain, then I use um, graffiti art paints. Or things like the, like I just said, the, the um, ebonizing lacquer. My favorite brand of graf graffiti art paints are Cobra brand. Um, and they just spray, they're called spray art technologies. And that's, I'm probably plugging uh, where I shouldn't be. But they're Cobra, Cobra um, paints for graffiti art. And they're a single coat. Literally, I'll spray one coat on. I won't have to go over it again. They're so good. There's so much pigment in there. And the colors are really, really cool colors as well. They're not the boring basics. They are really interesting colors. So Cobra paints. I have no links to them. They're just my favorite. Um, ben, yes, question. So a question here from Ricky about a pillar drill. Um, he's, he's saying, is it, he's only using it as an amateur. Would it be worth spending the extra money for the trade model? Um, he's thinking of accuracy. Uh, uh, really difficult. Unless you give me specifics on machines, um, I can't comment. Because some of our some of our craft machines, and in fact, we use craft machines next door um, in Ben's workshop. There's no issues with accuracy at all if we're talking woodwork. If you're an engineer and you want real precise accuracy, it's a different story. Yeah, absolutely. Trade industry machines, absolutely, yes. But for, for what we're doing here, I have no issues at all with the craft machines, genuinely. Um, because, I mean, we demonstrate on them all the time, so no, no problem at all. If it's just doing this sort of thing and you're into woodwork, fine. I'm just going to very quickly sand that little bit of waste off that's on the top um, of this hat here. And then we'll look at, uh, at doing a peak as well because we need to sand the peak. Also, sorry, Ben. There were that little bit of waste. Um, that's, that peak needs to be sanded. 
So we may as well get our disc on. So those sea jaws. Whilst I'm doing this, let me stay on, stay there, Ben. I'm going to just walk people through the, um, the the disc and everything. But whilst I'm doing this, let me just make you aware. There's a couple of things just gone live today. If you're interested in getting any bits and bobs, so and it's I've just picked out a few that are you know aimed at us wood turners. Um, some really good deals out there. The Axminster to Craft uh, three or five lathes on offer at the moment. Woodcut bowl saver. But what I've been looking at more than anything, the, the Crown five-piece Crow um, turning tool set, I think it's about 50 quid off of that at the moment. This is a really, really good one. Part number on that is 21384. And the pen turning starter packages, I think there's 20 quid off those at the moment. As well as the smocks, you see me wearing the smocks. Um, as well as the smocks, there's good deals to, to, to go. That's the Christmas deals. So they've gone live today. If you go to the Axminster website, look at the homepage, you'll see Christmas deals. Um, and then search anything wood turning. But I thought it might be worth highlighting those. There's some really good wood turning deals out there. We've been asked to mention lights as well um, by a few people and, and wood turning lights or lathes, uh, wood, lights for the wood turning lathes. Um, we're going to do a little piece on, on lights. We've got some, um, some of our favorites. This is particularly for a powered one. This is my favorite. It's just a bit cumbersome and in the way when I'm demonstrating. Um, but that's a great one. And um, we've got some new uh, rechargeable lights coming. Uh, that I, again, when we were in lockdown and we were in my own workshop, you would have seen me use those uh, an awful lot. But we're going to um, introduce you to those in the next few weeks as well. I'll just sound this, Ben, and then I'll come back to you. So just sound that a little bit of waste away. Now, being end grain... It's important that you get a really, really good finish on this. This is 100 grit on here. It's not good enough to leave a finish on here. So I would need to go to another grit as well. Um, so that's quite important. Make sure on this one, you get rid of any tears and nasties. And then you go to your finer grits to get that really, really good finish. Then. Because that's such a wide area of end grain, what I would do then is go neat sanding sealer on the top, sand it back. Give it another dose and sand it back before you add any paint. Otherwise, that paint will be sucked into this like it's a sponge um, and you'll get a poor, um, a poor coverage. It will look different on the side than it does the top. So really important to prep that well. Yes, Ben. So Nigel's asking... Um, could the hat be turned with the peak as part of it, as opposed to being uh, separate? You can. Um, uh, yeah, so, uh, again, uh, ask the same question in a couple of weeks when we do the smokers, because I'll do a little baseball cap for you. So it, it'll be done in the same way, where basically you turn the whole width of that peak and then sand the, the back and sides away. So, yeah, you could do that, but it just means that you, you're coming from a very large bit of timber. Um, that's the only thing in diameter wise so yes you could do okay so there's our peak peaks no oh, yeah no not the peak there's the top of the hat but it's no good without the peak so we're going to create one of those now this is just a piece of uh, um well antonia so no it's not it's a piece of cedar piece of cedar what i've got is just i guess that's about four millimeters you don't want to go too big with these you could use ply if you wanted to get some three mil ply that would be good as a peak but this is just a piece of, yeah, definitely cedar. Um, and a little template that I've got for all of these peaks. So we're going to scribe around that. I would advise then cutting that out on your scroll saw before you sand away. Um, I'm going to sand away because that's what I've got here. Whilst I've got there, I'll just put the hole in. We'll drill that in a minute. Okay, so we've got something to sand to now. All right. And again, whilst we're there, I'm going to do the. I'm going to do the nose as well. The nose is quite an interesting one, and we'll glue a bit together then. So, sanding table. I've gone on about this sanding table, so so much. So, Axminster wood turning, uh, stem, stop collar, and carving plate. Okay, add those together with a piece of MDF or plywood. And you get yourself a lovely little sanding table. Couple that together with your sanding disc you've made. 
We've got a whole nother machine. Lay speed is zero, turn the lathe on, dust extraction goes on. Let's get rid of the worst first. Right, now we can stand to our line. Always flip it over. You get these burrs on the bottom edge. So you flip it over and just go to the center of your disc to just a C nib. Then we're gonna take take that away and I just wanna sand the, the face. Just so you've got a nice finish, really. Can be fairly, fairly coarse, that timber. So let's give him a drill. Use a bit of scrap wood. This is a piece of scrap wood. Unfortunately, it's got far too much woodworm in it, so I can't use that piece. That's an old piece of sycamore. So I'm not, it's not, not sacrilege. It's uh There we are. We have our centre hole. Now we can start the next phase of the build. Just do a little bit more deburring on that hole a second. All right. Um, in terms of gluing these little figures together, these can stay whole for, you know, after the Christmas period. They don't need to be dismantled. Um, if you remember that we, when we done the pyramids a few weeks ago, we wanted to dismantle them after Christmas so they wouldn't break. But these are solid enough. So I would go for something like just a regular PVA wood glue. Um, however, what we're about to do next, so anything just with a small surface area, I would go definitely epoxy resin glue. Um, so... This is one that we're going to use. I'm just going to make a little nose shape, okay, for our figure and put a nose on because they start coming to life. When you start adding the facial features, that's when they start coming to life. For instance, let's have a look at the one that I've done last week for you. You can see just by adding a nose already, you're starting to get a little bit of character into the piece. Okay, so let's just create one of those. Now, don't start too small. We want to start with a decent bit of timber. And <laughs> you've seen all those, you've seen the pantomimes. Wicked Witch Nose is what we're going to create. A nice little proper conker, proper little hook nose. Dust extraction's got to go on. Best way to do it. Uh, let me try and get you a bit closer. Hang on there, Ben. Best way to do this, we're going to start by flattening off the face. Rounding over. So the actual nose, it's going to be about that. That's where we're going to cut them off in a minute. So I just want to shape the top. Uh, 
That'll do us. Very, very crude. However, let's just cut him off a moment. Uh, where's my saw? It's going to seem a little bit like overkill using a big saw like this one, but you can because it's a, a, a this is a pull saw. You can get away with doing things like this. Am I? Let me come back. Stay there, Ben. I'll just I'll adjust cameras before. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I could say, being a pool saw, you can get away with quite a lot, even though it's a big uh, tool for this particular job. And it's ever so quick in cutting as well. That's the other thing. Now, you can do a dozen of those nose shapes fairly quickly just by doing that. But then what you have to do is just very delicately create a little bit of a concave. So, again, I'll just use the... Again, it looks like overkill, but all I want to do, and you won't see this just for the minute, is a little concave to the joining area just by sanding a bit of the center section because what we, we'll do with this now is butt joint. Oh, we butt joint this on, so there. All right, I'm going to glue this now for you so I can get my big fat fingers out of the way. Um, and we're going to mix it. It's 50-50 mix on these epoxy glues. We'll keep them on there. I'll use that bit of wood waste. 50-50 mix. This is the five-minute version, so it, it literally does mean that you can work pretty much straight away after. Um, get, literally give it five minutes. Work on another part of the, the nutcracker. Um, and then away you go. Don't need much on this. One thing I'll say about uh, epoxy glue is um, if it's cold, so if, if, for instance, if you've got a cold season in the UK, the winter is going to be a lot colder, um, then the glue will harden and it's, it takes a long time to get out of the bottle. In the summer, it's nice and liquid. It's easy to use. So if you at all can use it um, or store it indoors as opposed to in the cold workshop, if you've got a particularly cold workshop, more the better. Um, I'm very lucky. I've got a little craft room at home. Um, we, we keep it there and we do all the glue in there as well. So it works. So just a wee bit, a tiny, tiny little bit. And this stuff is great for butt jointing because it'll hold, it'll hold in position almost instantly. And I'm going to show you something else as well. So once you've got a decent amount, and don't be afraid of this either. Um, so once you've put it on, if you get a little bit splurge out, don't worry. Don't try and wipe it off whilst it's wet. Wait until it's dried and then you can sand it away. It's great for doing that. So I'm going to position it. I'll show you in a minute and give it a bit of a push. There we are. Make sure we straight. And just leave it. Lie him down. Let it dry. Give it four or five minutes and that'll be ready to go. And you can start adding the blusher on and all those things. We don't want to glue anything yet because for painting, you'd want to take it apart and paint each piece individually. Yes, Ben. Uh, Nigel would like to know, what are the drawbacks to using CA glue for this type of work? Um, I, do you know, the reason that I'm not keen on CA glue for this thing, CA glue is brittle, and so it'll only take a tap and it'll fall apart, where epoxy, is there's a, there's a resistance. It's the hardest, the strongest glue I've found. Um, wood glue can be used, but the trouble with wood glue, it takes too long. That's that's the only thing. Um, no problem with CA glue. Um, it, it, if you use an accelerator a lot of the time, that reacts and you get a very white finish. If you use a thin, then it'll be drawn into the grain. Slow takes a long time to dry as well. This this epoxy will be dry quite, quite quickly. But that's my reasons, really, that and being so brittle. If I use that on the nose, the nose would fall off in a couple of years' time. So that would be the only reason. Um, we were just looking at arms then. Um, 
so this is one of the arms. If you want to bend the arms, for instance, this was a straight arm. And all we've done with this one, imagine that piece being turned around. I cut a 45, turned that 45 around, and we managed to bring and create the joint. I was talking to you about the epoxy, and it creates a little bit of a bead around the edge. Then you just go to your sander and just sand that bead, and you'll get a little welded joint like the one we've got here. So you get a really nice joint. And if you're going to paint that, you have almost an invisible um, joint. It literally is is it just disappears. It's almost like a weld in, in in effect, really. Right. So that's all of the turning. So I'm I'm guessing you all agree that's that's a fairly simple bit of turning. That one. It's not a tricky um, project. And we've said this before. Projects sometimes can look very difficult. Can sometimes look overwhelming if you look at the whole pieces as the as the whole. Take each individual piece separately. And it becomes fairly simple, just lengthy, just a little bit longer to, to do. We are we have got more questions, but we're also going to talk embellishments now as well. And um, what do we do to to make them pretty, as it were? Let's get a couple of these questions done for us. So, yes, Ben. So, well timed that one, Frederick. Um, he's asking, will you be showing how to apply paint or other color uh, to the project? You find that useful, right? Um, would we, Lerner would like to know if you're ready for Friday's quiz. Ready for Friday's quiz? Yes. Um, myself and Craig have been practicing, looking at encyclopedias, um, Wikipedia, and Googling everything. Yes, we're ready. Um, just while we're talking about that, SK Crafts on Friday night, 7.45. Um, myself and Craig are the Dorset Knobs. We're going to be taking on um, uh, Martin from Hampshire Sheen and Les Thorne, um, the Hampshire Hogs, um, in a, 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 a battle of wits. And if you know all four of us, that you know that won't take very long. So, yes, that's Friday night, 7.45, SK Crafts. HodgePodge would you like to know, um, would you ever consider adding a spline to the elbow joint, um, similar to Rebecca de Groot and her walking turnings? Putting a spline in? I'm a bit lost on that one. I'm really sorry. Um, so, no, I haven't because I don't know what you mean. Sorry about that one. Um, Frederick. Frederick's question about paint. Um, two things, Frederick. I'm not going to apply anything here. We, we, got, we are going to talk about it. Um, in terms of my transparent colors, two types of, of transparent, well, not two types, two, two manufacturers I'm favoring at the moment, and these are the reasons. So um, chestnut spirit stains, lovely, brilliant a massive range of colors including all the timber colors and the primary colors chromacraft um spirit uh, wood dyes um because of the the uh, they're not the primary colors they are in a red you'll get two or three different types of coral red for instance a post office red you know yet lots of those subtle different colors the teals are beautiful what have i got in front of me got lovely browns um uh, forest green so they're they're the different colors and i've used a lot of these on my viking smokers because they're the earthy tones as well so mixing those those two up together not literally but using them for different reasons if i want a transparent color I will apply them through an airbrush. And I find that quite important. Applying for an airbrush is very different than applying with a um, either a foam or a regular brush because you don't get the patchiness that you would get from a foam or, or regular brush. With an airbrush, it goes on uniform, and so you get a much better finish um, for that reason. And you, you don't have to go crazy with your airbrushes. Just get a single airbrush. If you're going to get a single airbrush, go with a, um, a gravity-fed airbrush that you can put a little bit in, use it, clean it out and go for the next color. If you if you want to get a few more airbrushes, then you can go with suction feed airbrushes where you can store bigger volumes of, of ink or paint in at a time. But that's for me, that's, that's good. It's quick because the ink dries very quickly. It almost goes on dry. Um, and I don't have to wash the, the um, airbrushes out every five seconds. I can keep them in there for a month if I want to. In fact, some of these have been in there for over uh, almost over a year now because um, I use them regularly. However, if we're going to go opaque colors, and I'm talking about this guy here now, so I'm not seeing the timber color through, then I'm going those um, aerosols. And you use the um, 
sort of puff techniques where you're just little sprays rather than keep spraying over and over and over again you want to keep about eight to nine inches away from the piece and just spray up and off up and off otherwise you get over spray and you'll get a spider web effect and you get too much and then you'll get runs all those sorts of things so little and often that's how we apply that's why i like the cobra paints um and things like the the ebonizing lacquers uh, i really like those because they're so um so much pigment they're they're covering a single hit okay so that's for me is the way we go then after you've done your painting and absolutely take these to pieces Use um, paint sticks, so those little bits of six mil dowel to hold while you're painting, and then a piece of um, uh, a piece of timber, a sacrificial bit of timber with lots of six mil holes in. That you can then stand those paint sticks in to, to allow to dry if you're using wet paints. Um, also on the lathe, you can you can paint on the lathe. Well, why not? You know, again, use paint sticks, um, hold that in a chuck, do your paintings, especially if you're gonna put hard lines in so let's say for instance we're doing the kneecaps here the which is a which are a gold color if you want to do lapels before you bend the arms all of those sorts of things to get a nice crisp line sometimes mechanically done is is a bit easier um and then again embellishments i've told you about um the tiny turner emma cook's website that is your stop for all of the the lovely bits of fur and there's around I, don't, I haven't counted but it's looked to be about 20 different colors on there so you can go for whatever color you want to um in here i've got just three um colors i've got the gray and i've got the sort of rabbit type or style and then i've got the black um the black and gray they're they're really nice um but then you just raid your local craft shops DIY craft shops and this is a little tray that we've got from our from my craft room at home and what's good here well I love getting these sort of um, these braided uh, strings I use these for several things really again if we look at this drummer here sorry Ben I'm having you move all over the place this drummer here maybe if I do the above shot can you have a look at that so look at the strings that we've got for not just the buttons between the buttons but holding the drum those sorts of things they're really useful for that and then the buttons on that guy are um um oh da, 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 da. ben help me out here what are they from they are from they are upholstery. from upholstery that was the word i was looking for they're upholstery pins and you can get upholstery pins online in packers of 100 really really cheap so and and some really colorful ones as well so you can make them suit the figure that you're doing. But what have we got? We've got those. We've got all sorts of Christmas ribbon in here. Um, <laughs> there's even a little crown crown for the next time I do a, a queen shape. But little stick on jewels, really nice to put on um, any royalty that you're going to create. Nice little pendants there. Now, the queen, when you do a queen, and I'm really sorry, I don't have a picture. I didn't think about this. don't have a picture of um, of one of the queens. Ben, do you still have those stills that we used yesterday of the other soldiers? Um, because this will get people understanding what I'm talking about. So when we, again, think about when they these um, guys were actual nutcrackers. Now look at their beards. So beneath the teeth there. Um, obviously, a queen is not going to have a beard. So what a queen has instead is ribbon. So it's like a ruffle on their gown um, instead of a beard. So for that, I'm using... Nice one, Ben. For that, I'm using this material here. Um, this is like, um, it was just, just a ribbon. And again, it got that in all colors, all, sh all, um, all sizes, around about 25 mils, what I'm using most of the time. But there we are. So that's a good idea for that. And in terms of the collars and cuffs, again, this is your local hobby store. You can get this edging, again, for upholst upholstery, really. Um, but it's great for the lapels and for, for collars uh, and cuffs, like I say. Again, you can get that in all colors. But just fill your box with lots of different crafty bits, um, little love hearts for Queen of Hearts and stuff. There we are. There's some upholstery pins that are the same, same thing. Ben, do we have any questions before I sign off for the day? Just having a quick look through. Um, Hodgepodge was... When he's talking about a spline, you know when you cut like a little slice and then pop in... Um, it's like a 
joint. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I haven't. No, be, I'll tell you why. Is is simply because that butt joint with epoxy just is so strong. I've tried to break those before and broken the timber without breaking the glue join. It's that strong. So I would certainly recommend that. And it's it, so it's a step that I didn't need to do. No, no, I understand where you're coming from now. No. All right, we're good. Um, guys, thank you ever so much again for dropping by. Thanks, Rema, um, for dropping by as well and for letting us use your your website and for supplying that uh, that for us. Really great stuff. Um, don't forget below you'll see the line drawing. So download that. You can start building your nutcracker. Send us in all the pictures that you can. Don't forget those Christmas deals have started today. So have a look if there's anything um, that you want to put on Santa's list. Um, have a look and see what we've got to offer. But again, thanks for stopping by and I'll see you next week for more Woodworking Wisdom. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.